Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the, well, it's sort of the Friday Public Affairs lunch, but not entirely by any means, <laughs> probably not mostly. But at, at the time of the Friday Public Affairs lunch, a special presentation by Professor Jason Scott Robert. Um, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, one is that I am Joe White, the director of the Center for Policy Studies. Um, if you're interested in the, the center's uh, activities or the Friday lunch, uh, the website is policy.case.edu. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the traditions of the uh, Friday lunch is at the beginning of the lunch, we ask if anybody has any announcements they want to make about talks going on on campus or anything of the sort to share with the group here. So does anybody have any announcements? I will say that there is a, a really good series going on about China, uh, sponsored by the Asian Studies Program. Uh, I don't have the details with me, but if you were to look up the Asian Studies Program uh, or the Policy Studies website um, uh, on the CASE website, you would find they're really doing a really a good series. And also, the Department of English, if you go to the Department of English website, uh, they're doing a really fine series of four journalists coming to town. They're actually, I think they're going to be speaking at the Botanical Gardens. Uh, but one of them is Lawrence Wright, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book about Al-Qaeda and the failure to pay attention to it. Uh, and that's the first one of them, but there's, there's four very distinguished journalists coming to town. So we've got some good stuff going on on campus over the next couple of months. Um, beyond that, I would like to very much thank Shannon French, the director of the, oh, one other thing. Next week's topic is the challenge of increasing faculty diversity and the speaker will be uh, Dr. and Professor Marilyn Mobley, who is the University Vice President for Inclusion and Diversity, talking about what makes a job hard and maybe we can give us some feedback on that. Um, so that should be an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, with that, I would like to turn the podium over to uh, Professor Shannon French, uh, Director of the Inamori Cent International Center for Ethics and Excellence, who is the real host of today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you for your co-sponsorship of this event. And I would also like to thank the Department of Bioethics for their co-sponsorship, and we have them to thank for the yummy Panera sandwiches. Uh, on a practical note, um, those of you who are arriving, uh, don't be shy. There are some chairs, particularly way up front. <laughs> so um, please uh, feel free, and, and people will make room for you. Welcome, uh, those of you particularly who've never been here before, to uh, the Inamori Center. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here today for this guest speaker, and we hope that you will uh, join us again for future events. I am delighted to, on a personal level to have Jason here. He's a good colleague and a good friend, and I met him, uh, or rather saw him speak for the first time at Chautauqua, at the Chautauqua Institute this past summer and enjoyed it so much myself that I decided we must bring him to campus. Now, it took me a little bit longer than I had hoped because uh, in the interim, the uh, Lincoln Center at Arizona State University, with which Jason is affiliated, uh, joined with our center and several other centers and institutions across the country to form a very exciting new research consortium. And I direct you to our Inamori Center website to the research tab to learn more about this effort. But this is a new research consortium to explore ethical, legal, and social issues concerning emerging technologies. So uh, there's a lot to look at and uh, some, some things we're trying to get a little bit out ahead of as we do our research. Jason is involved in that research consortium, and so we got him here on campus last semester for a workshop for that, but once again did not get him to speak. So in a truly uh, gracious manner, he agreed to play the reverse snowbird and come back to Cleveland in January. <laughs> so we appreciate him uh, leaving uh, sunny Arizona to come here. He is the Lincoln professor, Associate Professor of Ethics in Biotechnology and Medicine and Associate Professor of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. He directs the Bioethics Policy and Law Program, part of the Center for Biology and Society. In addition, he serves as Associate Professor of Basic Medical Sciences at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, in partnership with ASU. 
where he is the director of education for the scholarly project and director of the medicine and society theme. Goodness, when do you sleep? <laughs> but, uh, he earned his PhD in philosophy in 2000 and is extensively published in bioethics and philosophy of biology, including papers in leading science, philosophy, and bioethics journals, and a book which I highly recommend to you, Embryology, Epigenesis, and Evolution, Taking Development Seriously. Today he's here to speak to us on the intriguing topic of chimeras, cyborgs, and the moral limits of science. Jason, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, yeah, I grew up in Montreal, so I'm accustomed to some cold weather. And as it's already been underscored to me, this isn't as cold as it could be, and it's certainly not as cold as it is in Montreal, and so on. So. Uh, all of this is true. I, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to address this topic with you. Unlike Shannon, I'm not going to highly recommend my first book to you. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting for philosophers of biology, but nobody else will love it. The next book, though, is uh, on this topic, and I'm still trying to figure out if this is going to be the actual title of the book or if I'm going to be playing around a little bit. What I'm going to do for the next little while is tell you some stories about emerging technologies, uh, primarily in the neurosciences, which is where I've been focusing. Uh, I'm interested in uh, both uh, areas in which stem cell research uh, and the development of neural prosthetics, so neuroengineering, bioengineering research, uh, intersects with ethical concerns about the nature of human beings. And so uh, this is a hot topic. The latest issue of National Geographic, for instance, has on its cover uh, Merging Man and Machine, the Bionic Age, uh, which features uh, the work of one of uh, cases uh, famed uh, by medical engineers, uh, Hunter Peckham. And it's a, a nice little overview of some of the advances, uh, some of the stuff that I'll be talking about uh, today. So I'm going to tell you some stories. Some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is a little bit make-believe. Some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about instead is uh, actually real. Uh, the stuff that's make-believe is not entirely far out there, though, uh, for the most part. And it's the kind of thing that we as ethicists, but also primarily as citizens, as regular people in a diverse, uh, complex civil society such as ours, we've got to worry about uh, the developments in science and technology in productive and useful ways, rather than uh, simply by being either reactionary and opposed, or for that matter, reactionary, and in favor of whatever scientists and engineers are up to. And so uh, without further ado, I'll tell you a quick story about The Simpsons. Uh, I understand we're still waiting for some other folks to get here, and so I'll just uh, uh, do this. Sometimes I like to show the, the clip, but we don't have time to do that, and I didn't know how to get the technology to work. So the story is uh, there's an episode where Homer blows all the money uh, that the family's been saving and decides that he needs to make some extra money. So in order to do so, he uh, asks Barney, uh, his good friend at the bar, uh, how Barney earns extra money, and Barney tells him that he's a volunteer for medical experiments. And uh, Homer says, this sounds like an excellent idea. So he goes to the Screaming Monkey uh, Medical Research Center, where he volunteers his efforts. Uh, very quickly into the experiments, uh, it turns out that uh, after a brain uh, x-ray, it's clear that Homer has a crayon lodged deep in his brain. And this crayon uh, is part of what potentially explains how he can be so unbelievably dense. And so uh, Homer uh, remembers how the crayon might have gotten there as a lad. He shoved crayons one after another up his nose and was counting them as they went in. Uh, he then sneezed. And upon sneezing, all the crayons, uh, he thought, sprayed out. He just looked at them and said, oh, I guess that's all of them. And of course, this one had been stuck uh, in his brain ever since. Why had it never been picked up by the doctor, uh, Dr. Uh, Hibbert, is that right? Uh, the main reason being that when he holds up the x-rays, he always puts his thumb like so, and that covers where the crayon was in the brain. Homer asks them to remove the crayon, uh, uh, and they go ahead and do this. Uh, and Homer is, uh, as it were, cu uh, cured of his dullness. All of a sudden, he's, uh, well, he comes home, as he puts it, in a spiffy nerd ensemble, so a t bow tie, a regular tie, and a, a sweater vest, uh, and uh, becomes fast friends with Lisa, his daughter, uh, is able to challenge uh, the, the cleverest amongst uh, uh, Springfield's uh, cognoscenti, and makes a significant uh, change in his life, sort of very flowers for Algernon. That's the kind of story here. But then things start to unravel for Homer. He's very uh, under, under attack from his uh, friends as he decides to do things that you know, clever people would do, but that are really getting in the way of their enjoyment of life. So he decides he needs to have the crayon put back into his brain. 
He goes to the Screaming Monkey uh, Medical Research Center, asks the scientists if they would put the crayon back in his brain. Uh, they said, I'm sorry, Mr. Simpson, we can't do that. We don't play God here. And Homer turns to them and says, I beg to differ. You do nothing but play God, and I'm sure your octo parrot would agree. At which point, the camera pans over to a parrot with tentacles who squawks, Polly shouldn't be. And in some ways, what I'm going to talk to you about today is whether or not Polly or these other uh, part human, whether chimeras or cyborgs, uh, really ought to be. So um, Carl Elliott, who's a philosopher of science uh, and bioethicist, philosopher of medicine, bioethicist at University of Minnesota, uh, likes to use this kind of thing as a disclaimer. And I'm just going to stroll up here so I can read it to you. Uh, sometimes when I'm talking to a person who is planning to freeze his head in a vat of liquid nitrogen when he dies, which incidentally, if you want to do, you can do in Scottsdale at the Alcor Life uh, Extension Foundation uh, on a road called a coma, which I think is so ironic. but. Uh, <laughs> They didn't notice that it was on that street, apparently. Uh, or who's debating the merits of creating a race of human chimpanzee hybrids, or who is earnestly telling me about the pluses and minuses of living for eternity as a disembodied sequence of binaries on a computer mainframe, my first impulse is to look directly into his eyes. What I'm looking for, I think, is a kind of twinkle, a raised eyebrow, the hint of a wink, something to let me know that he understands that he might come across as a little eccentric. It's not that I'm uninterested in conjecture and speculation, Elliot continues. I teach philosophy for a living, and the standard philosophy syllabus includes matter-of-fact articles about brains and vats, beetles and boxes, and your moral duties should you wake up one morning and find yourself connected to a life support machine with a dying violinist. But a rational conversation in a philosophy department, uh, philosophy classroom might, in another context, be a sign of incipient psychosis. So when someone wants to debate with me the democratic rights of robots, I want first to establish that he can pass a mental status exam. I put this up here. Uh, hopefully you'll see, uh, I mean, you won't have the same uh, curiosity about me. I'm not going to be arguing for the, uh, the quite extreme positions that, uh, that Elliot's uh, uh, parodying here. But nonetheless, I am going to be talking about stuff that's a little bit far out there. But hopefully, you'll see why it's relevant uh, these days. So this is one of the pictures that was on uh, the, the poster announcing this talk. And this is uh, you know, certainly uh, one image that comes to mind when people think of chimeras. Uh, this is a chimera sort of, uh, really a name only, though. Uh, this uh, poor uh, mouse didn't have the ear uh, grow on his back. The ear is uh, made of uh, is, is a bioengineered piece of work made of of a non-living matter that it was then uh, injected under the skin of the mouse to see whether, in fact, that it would maintain its structure and would be biocompatible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, this did set off some uh, concern in some quarters that uh, we have to worry about what these crazy bioengineers are up to. Uh, some other examples of that, perhaps. This is going back now a quarter century uh, to when the first uh, uh, a success sort of bridging or, or, or breaching the reproductive barrier between sheep and goats was achieved. Uh, and these uh, sheep-goat chimeras are referred to sometimes as yeep. Uh, and they, uh, this was a sort of a fascinating breakthrough. The idea was eventually someday we might be able uh, to do interesting things, understand more about the physiology of reproduction, et cetera, but also be able to uh, do work in experimental biology that would allow us uh, to really move forward in uh, with regard to progress uh, toward curing uh, human diseases. Now, uh, the, Geep, the GEEP stuff comes back, uh, takes us back to some work 15 years before that in 1969 when Nicole Le Duarain was doing some work uh, with the quail uh, and chick uh, systems. And the idea with her work was, look, we have no way of marking cells when we transfer cells from one entity to another entity. We have no idea of tracking which cells are the host animal cells and which cells are the new ones. This is before the development of, of green fluorescent protein and other kinds of markers that could be used in this regard. And one of the things that Le Duarte and her group realized in the 1960s was that you could very easily uh, uh, transplant uh, cells from the quail to the chicken or the chicken to the quail, they were, the cells were uh, different. They looked different one from the next under the microscope. So you could tell which ones were the quail cells and which ones were the chick cells. And this enabled them to have a sense of what would happen to the cell fate upon transplantation. We don't need to do that anymore because we now have the ability uh, to mark the cells or to tag them fluorescently. But nonetheless, there's still some work ongoing in this domain. Uh, uh, Ladouare didn't call her things quicks or or um, uh, you know, whatever you might, I guess, chails would be the other possibility. Uh, these guys uh, didn't call them uh, quacks either. But nonetheless, the idea, I think, is similar. And if you just take a quick look at this, I don't have a pointer. I don't 
think, unless, no, I don't have a pointer. But in any event, if you take a look up here, the, uh, the duck uh, clearly has a, a quite long beak. The quail uh, has a quite short beak. If you transplant the cells from the quail into the duck or the duck into the quail, uh, it's possible to get both phenotypes in the final uh, uh, creature. So you can see that this one has both, so the top beak of a, a duck and the bottom, uh, the lower beak of a quail. And the idea here is to get a better sense of what happens in development. So it's not just checking to see where the cells are going, but also checking to see what they're actually doing uh, in the developmental process. Now we can do this a lot more easily with a green fluorescent protein or other kinds of, of uh, resources. Green fluorescent protein was uh, originally isolated from uh, the Cnidarian Aquaria Victoria, uh, basically a jellyfish, and uh, has now been used for a variety of experiments. And what we can do is assess uh, by, by tagging cells, uh, we can assess what happens to cells during development, whether we're talking about cells from uh, you know, we can tag some of the cells, say, in the neural crest part uh, of the developing embryo and then see where those cells uh, uh, go out to in the, in the course of development into the mature organism. So this is, uh, an, the idea here is to tag cells. This is a tobacco plant. Uh, these are zebra fish that have been tagged with green fluorescent protein. These are mice that have been tagged with green fluorescent protein. Uh, this is ALBA. Uh, ALBA was tagged with green fluorescent protein. This is uh, not what ALBA actually looks like in a bright room against a white background, but this is how ALBA is sometimes portrayed. How many of you have heard of ALBA? couple of you. Alba was uh, commissioned by a uh, Chicago-based artist, Eduardo Katz, uh, and he found a group in Europe who was willing to uh, undergo the experiment with him. What he was interested in was producing transgenic art. What he wanted was an opportunity to say, look, scientists are doing some interesting stuff. It's potentially morally interesting uh, or morally worrisome, so why don't we, uh, but regular people aren't interested in what ethicists or what scientists have to say, but they are interested in what artists have to say, so let's see if we can commission a piece of transgenic art. So Alba was the uh, first of the, uh, uh, of the, in the series. Uh, he then actually went to Arizona State University and worked with some of my uh, colleagues there. This was before my time at ASU, uh, but they were involved in producing uh, some of the art, the animals that were used in his, uh, um, his transgenic art efforts. And uh, it's not clear how successful Katz was in stimulating public discussion about this, primarily because he sort of looked like he was uh, it, that, like it was more of a publicity ploy for him rather than a serious attempt at public engagement. Uh, and if you go to his website, you can read the guest book and all the kinds of things that regular people were saying, most of which was, I wish all of our pets were like this, then we'd be able to find them at night. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry when they go out in the yard. We wouldn't hit them with our cars and so on. But it's not real serious engagement with what it is that scientists and engineers are actually doing in the world. Now, the green fluorescent protein story is really interesting and has been used in a variety of domains. Here, the idea isn't just to track uh, where the uh, cells are going, which ones are from the host and so on, but to be able to get expression of the green fluorescent protein in various tissues of the animal, uh, uh, so born animals. So here's some work with pigs and here's some work with uh, the first of the non-human primates that's referred to as a transgenic primate. Uh, and this is Andy. Uh, his name is inserted DNA, spelt backwards because it's inserted DNA in a reverse direction, uh, was the technology that was used to create Andy. And you can see that in the litter from which Andy was produced, uh, there are some uh, uh, images in, labeled B and C here, where you get some expression of green, of green fluorescent protein in hair shafts and in the toenails of the stillborn male. It's not quite clear how much uh, GFP expression you get in Andy himself, in the surviving uh, one of the surviving animals, but nonetheless, this did raise a lot of, of interest. So this was published in 2001, around that time in a variety of places, uh, and you know, Eduardo Katz was doing his work at this time as well. Katz was doing this with a bunny, and bunnies are cute and so on, but they're not really like humans. But Andy's very much closer to humans than a rabbit would be. He looks sort of human. He wears t-shirts in all of the pictures of him. Uh, he was being raised in a nursery, the, uh, the, the uh, the beauty of which is the kind of nursery that we all wish we had been raised in. I mean, it's absolutely spectacular surroundings. And yet he's transgenically produced. And so some folks started to wonder, you know, are we starting to get a little bit too close to home here? Is this stuff, despite the fact that the rationale for most of the experimentation is to move us forward to developing treatments that might be useful for uh, human beings, are we getting to a point now where what 
seemed science fictional now become now might become science factual, and this is potentially raising some uh, some moral issues about what we're doing to these non-human animals. Now, another example here. This is a, a, a sheep. Uh, this sheep at the time was living in uh, Reno, um, Nevada, uh, at the University of Nevi uh, Nevada at Reno Medical Center. There's a uh, biologist there named Esmail Zanjani, and Zanjani became quite well renowned uh, for his attempt to grow uh, human livers in the sheep. And here's the story. We all know that there's a serious dearth of organs available for transplantation. If any of you ever need an organ, uh, you can expect to spend a lot of time on a waiting list waiting for that organ. There have been attempts to try to increase the number of organs that are available for transplantation. Those haven't been widely successful. There have been attempts to, uh, say, transplant the organs from non-human animals into the human body. Uh, those haven't been wildly successful, uh, primarily because of immune rejection. So our body recognizes the tissue as foreign and therefore is not happy to accept it as part of us. Uh, it's possible to dampen our immune system. It's possible to transgenically modify the animals from which we're uh, getting the tissue to sort of improve the likelihood of a match. But what Zanjani is trying to do is actually take this a step further. Let's use the sheep as an incubator, as a kind of oven, if you like, for baking the bun where the bun is a human liver. I know that sounds weird. but. Uh, <laughs> And so if what we can do is transplant human uh, hematopoietic stem cells into the developing sheep, uh, as the sheep grows, this liver might take on a little bit of sheepy characteristics, a little bit of, of uh, there might be a little bit of so-called contamination. But nonetheless, this would be uh, a liver that is primarily human rather than uh, primarily sheep made to look human. Not, uh, so it's what, a sheep in human clothing or whatever. It's not that at all. And so Zanjani thought this one might be the next uh, big breakthrough. The work hasn't actually progressed anywhere near as well as he'd like, and there has been some uh, moral concern about the treatment of the animals. But nonetheless, this is still potentially an area of interest. Now, at, uh, about a few years before Zanjani was getting interested in this, uh, this uh, guy came on the scene. Does anybody know who that is? That's Oliver, the human Z. Oliver uh, was a quite civilized uh, chimpanzee. Ho Oliver uh, would smoke cigars. Uh, he'd shake your hand upon entering a room. As you can tell, uh, he's bipedal. The only uh, primates who are bipedal are humans. But uh, here's Oliver up and about uh, on two legs. And Oliver, there was some serious uh, scientific questing to discover whether Oliver was, in fact, entirely chimpanzee, or rather, was he a part human, part chimpanzee hybrid? Uh, and one of the scientists who was involved in exploring uh, the DNA of Oliver is uh, a colleague of mine, Ann Stone, and she can attest uh, full on that Oliver was entirely uh, chimpanzee. He just happened to have been socialized in particular ways and happened to have some physical characteristics that made him a lot more human-like. That said, maybe even superhuman, because how many of us are gentlemanly these days anyway, right? I mean, the, the kinds of behaviors that he exhibited are not really uh, uh, the sort of 21st century human behaviors, maybe 19th century human behaviors. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what happened uh, in 1997 related to this is that a developmental biologist named Stuart Newman from, uh, uh, from New York State uh, decided that he was really uh, interested in exploring the possibility of getting a patent on a part human, part chimpanzee creature, or at least on the technique for creating such a creature. So Stuart Newman uh, uh, made an application to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in, 2000, in 1997 sorry, for a hypothetical part human, part chimpanzee creature. And this was referred to as the Humanzee Patent Quest. Uh, he was eventually denied the, uh, uh, the application. Uh, seven years later, uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office decided he could not patent the technique for creating a part human, uh, part chimpanzee creature. Now, why do you think he would have wanted to have uh, uh, the patent on this technique in the first place? What good could come from that? Any ideas? Ah, well, that's exactly one strategy, right? If you get the patent, then nobody else can patent it. And what good is having the patent so that nobody else has it? What good is that? Royalties. Well, exactly. He could then license other people to do it, uh, to exercise the, the technology, and then he would be able to reap the benefits. This is not what was motivating Stuart Newman, though. Stuart Newman was actually backed up by an anti-biotechnology activist 
uh, who, uh, along with Stuart Newman, was very concerned about the direction in which science was going. And so Newman thought if he could get a patent on this technique, he could put it in his drawer and not let anybody use it for a period of 15 or 20 years, during which it would be possible, he hoped, to have a civilized, moral, and political discussion about uh, whether or not this is a a boundary that we want to breach with our uh, scientific work. And this idea of creating not an Oliver, but of something a little bit uh, uh, more realistically part human and part chimpanzee, this really got him uh, uh, on the front page of a lot of newspapers, really got him a lot of attention. But as I say, he did not succeed in securing the patent. Now, part of this, uh, he considers this partly a, a, go um, a victory, because part of the claim was that the thing that he was proposing to patent is not patentable subject matter. In other words, because it, as the language was put, it embraces a human, this entity, a part human, part chimpanzee creature, embraces a human, and you can't patent a human, therefore you can't patent this human Z creature. So he thought this was partially a victory, right? He couldn't get the patent, but somebody else uh, couldn't either. But at the same time, um, there's been some speculation that had he actually created the part human, part chimpanzee creature, rather than just wanted to patent the technique on creating it, he might have succeeded in getting the patent. And had he succeeded in getting the patent, uh, and the fact that he hadn't succeeded doesn't mean that somebody else can't succeed. Nobody has to date, but nonetheless. Now, this was uh, the topic of conversation in an article in a 2004 issue of Mother Jones, in which Mark Dowie uh, published a piece called Of Gods and Monsters. And that piece has this piece of artwork as the uh, uh, as the cover art. And the idea in uh, Dowie's piece was to explore what was going on uh, with Stuart Newman's patent quest. Why was Newman after this patent? What good would it do? And so on. And this was published just after the patent had been rejected. One of the fascinating parts of this, though, is that he, uh, Dowie, interviewed the person who was at the time of the rejection of or at the time of Stuart uh, Newman's initial application, the guy who was the uh, uh, US Commissioner of Patents, Bruce Lehman. And Bruce Lehman had this to say to the reporter. Stuart Newman is promoting an effort that will make it difficult to engage in biological research and commercialize the fruits of that research. It's not funny or cute. It's profoundly wrong. Every attempt to stop science has been characterized by darkness. Well. That's maybe a little strong. Every attempt to stop science has been characterized by darkness. But nonetheless, this does get us into the domain of what role should there be, if any, uh, in uh, private citizens or uh, on the part of ethicists to regulate the direction in which scientists are taking their craft. Ought there to be moral limits on science? Now, I mentioned before Eduardo Katz. Does anybody recognize uh, these guys? Few of you. So this is um, uh, artist uh, Patricia Piccinini's uh, sculpture of the Young family, and as you can see, uh, these are. I mean, uh, hopefully you find them to be a little bit unsettling. That was the ambition, right? Uh, this is something that's got a very much a human-like face, but at the same time is obviously either dog-like or or pig-like, uh, and uh, you know is suckling a litter of uh, of of these babies. Uh, this. Uh, the idea behind this piece of art, again, was to get people talking about what are we doing uh, in the world of science and technology. Of course, no scientists are actually creating these kinds of things. But that said, how far is this from what Esmail Zanjani is doing with his growing livers in, uh, in sheep? How far is this from the work that uh, Evan Snyder and colleagues at Harvard at the time were doing in transplanting human neural stem cells into the brains of developing rhesus macaques uh, or uh, African vervet, green, uh, uh, African green uh, monkeys? Uh, how how much difference is there between those kinds of experiments, which are ongoing, which are putatively well justified, uh, and the kinds of things that these uh, artists are maintaining ought to be the focus of conversation? So I should say just a quick word about uh, another area in which there's been some of this uh, uh, blending of human and non-human animal uh, parts at the cellular level. And this is the uh, effort to develop uh, part human. Uh, 
embryos as a source of human or almost entirely human pluripotent stem cells. Uh, the, the idea behind the science is very straightforward, uh, and in part the idea here is that it can help us avoid some ethical concerns with human pluripotent stem cell research. How do you get human pluripotent stem cells? Typically, uh, you isolate the cells from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst, and in isolating the cells from the inner cell mass, you destroy the blastocyst, so that embryo no longer uh, exists as an embryo. It's just a, a bunch of tissue. You've got the, the pluripotent cells from the inner cell mass. Uh, some folks are, uh, would object to two parts of this. Uh, one part is uh, they would object to the termination of the life of an embryo. And the other part is some folks might actually object uh, in a variety of different ways to the creation of that embryo in the first place, especially if the embryo is created uh, through in vitro fertilization, because in order to do that, you need to get eggs from a woman. And uh, it's not easy to get eggs from a woman. It's not easy uh, for the woman. Uh, she would have to undergo a course of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation or ovarian stimulation uh, just shy of hyperstimulation so that she produced more uh, eggs. And then she'd have to undergo a relatively straightforward, but nonetheless not risk-free, uh, surgical um, uh, uh, intervention in order to harvest those eggs, uh, which would then be fertilized uh, in the dish and used to grow into the four to eight cell stage, at which point uh, they become a blastocyst shortly after that, and you can isolate the inner cell mass. Getting eggs from women is, uh, for some folks, very morally troubling, and so creating the embryo and destroying the embryo are both morally problematic or morally controversial kinds of activities. So the idea here is, instead of using eggs from women, let's use eggs from non-human animals. Uh, in this case, in the figure on the, on the left, you see uh, eggs from uh, a cow might be used. So we don't have the same kind of moral concerns, typically, about cows as we have about women. Uh, as sources of the eggs, you don't mind the stimulation of the cows in order to get the oocytes. You get the oocytes, you enucleate them, you pop the nucleus right out of those eggs, and then fuse it with a human skin or other somatic cell, like an epithelial, uh, epithelial cell from the cheek. Uh, and that uh, cell begins to divide uh, upon a chemical or electrical stimulation into <clears throat> uh, a two cell, then a four cell, then an eight cell uh, organism, which can at the blastocyst stage be destroyed, and you can harvest the, it, the cells in the inner cell mass. And at the bottom of that figure, you see there's a sort of a hollow ball with some cells in the middle. The cells in the middle are the inner cell mass. These cells would be genetically identical or almost entirely genetically identical to the somatic cell uh, of the human donor, and they would have just a little tiny bit of mitochondrial DNA left over from the egg cell of the, of the uh, cow or the rabbit or uh, whoever was the source of the egg cell in the first place. And so the thought is we can harvest these eggs from non-human animals more easily than we can harvest them from women. And when we're destroying this thing, we're destroying something that never could become a person because nobody is going to voluntarily gestate this uh, kind of cowboy uh, uh, embryo. And so, uh, and destroying it is a lot less morally controversial than destroying uh, a human embryo, so let's go ahead and do this. So some scientists in the UK in particular, but with lots of other folks in the US and elsewhere interested, there was an attempt uh, to get permission, and in fact, uh, permission was secured from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the United Kingdom to go ahead and try to isolate uh, human-esque uh, pluripotent stem cells in this way uh, from this uh, uh, this cybrid or chimeric uh, embryo entity. Now that work has, I mean, there's some of it's still ongoing, but the work's largely been superseded by uh, the effort to to create uh, or to induce pluripotency in cells that are more mature, and sort of sidestepping the idea of using embryos altogether as a source of human pluripotent stem cells. But nonetheless, this is still uh, on the horizon, potentially. So let's switch gears a little bit from chimeras and cybrids, where we're talking about uh, uh, blending human and animal tissue, uh, and move on to uh, the topic of, of this National Geographic article, Merging Man and Machine. And so you can see here, perhaps, some quite familiar cyborg-like creatures. On the left, you've got the Borg Queen, and in the middle, Locutus of Borg, both from Star Trek. Uh, the next generation, and uh, the, the Borg is a sort of collective intelligence that assimilates all of its members. Uh, they uh, are part of a, a, a larger and a hive uh, mentality. There's one queen and all the drones are subservient uh, to the queen. They lose their personal identity and instead become part of the Borg. Uh, on the right, you know who that is? 
governor. Right, the governor of uh, California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, uh, you know, and again, there are lots of interesting pop culture uh, um, uh, examples of cyborgs. There have also been, you know, folks like uh, Steve Mann here, who starting, uh, you know, 30 years ago uh, to develop a variety of wearable computers. You can see these were pretty uh, intrusive kinds of things. You see him walking down the street wearing that kind of getup. You have a feeling uh, he's not, well, you might have a feeling he's not quite right, but you certainly have a feeling uh, that he doesn't look like everybody else there. Uh, but uh, as you can see, just even uh, by 10 years ago, uh, the same kind of uh, technology is now now available in a much more, uh, you know, a much smaller kind of package. And when I was flying in here yesterday, I was reading in the Sky Mall magazine uh, about various kinds of things that are in this ballpark, right? The glasses that you can put on uh, and plug into your iPod so that you're watching your iPod on a big screen TV in front of your eyes right there instead of actually watching your little tiny iPod, uh, or the sunglasses, which look very much like the ones that Steve Mann's wearing on the right, that have a video camera embedded in them so that you can take two and a half hours of surreptitious video uh, of, you know, any time that you want to take video while wearing sunglasses, presumably. Uh, nonetheless, these are attempts to sort of uh, create uh, a melding, at least at some superficial level, of the capabilities of machines with the capabilities of humans. Uh, some folks would refer to Blackberries, the, uh, the uh, use of a Blackberry as falling in the same domain. And I can certainly say that I am a, a very different person now from who I was uh, five years ago, be six years ago, before I got uh, the, the Blackberry. My wife refers to the sort of pre-Blackberry Jason and the post-Blackberry Jason. Uh, the pre-Blackberry Jason you know, would, would talk to her and, and so on uh, <laughs> at night while falling asleep and the post Blackberry Jason is doing this kind of thing all the time. She's uh, gotten the ultimate revenge though because she has an iPod Touch now, not even an iPhone like Dr. French has, but an, iP an iPod Touch and so she's doing this kind of thing all the time at night. I haven't talked to her in months uh, <laughs> except on my Blackberry when I call her from the road. Um, <laughs> And so you can get a sense sometimes that our personalities already are being affected in interesting kinds of ways uh, by this kind and yes, our relationships indeed in terms of, uh, especially in terms of how they interact with our personality. Uh, and I'll, I can tell you, and maybe this has happened to some of you, and if so, I sympathize, uh, but I dropped my Blackberry once upon a time uh, before I got this sort of nice, and it's funny that they call it a skin, right? So it's almost, it's got this sort of human-esque quality to it with the skin on it. The skin means I can drop it now and not cry, but back in the day, when I dropped it, I cried because the screen broke. It took four days for the T-Mobile people to get me a new one, and during those four days, I was lost. No idea where I was supposed to be. I don't have uh, administrative staff like this, the Inamori Center has, so I had nobody I could call. Even if I could call them, I didn't have a cell phone to call them on. It was absolutely miserable time. But I'm actually interested in, in going a little bit deeper than that. Insofar as with chimeras, I'm not interested in the pig heart valves, which some folks have. I'm not interested in um, blood transfusions. I'm a little bit interested in, the, in organ transplantation, whole organ transplantation. I'm, I'm really interested in sort of pushing toward a more integrative uh, approach to the human and the non-human animal. Similarly with this, even though in many ways this is already ingrained in our bodies and our personalities and so on, I'm actually interested in uh, talking about devices that are much more invasive than just those ones. So you can see again pop fictional or uh, pop cultural fictional representations of cyborgs. This is the stuff I grew up on. Uh, the six million dollar man, uh, we have the technology, we can rebuild him was the tagline for that television program. I understand the Bionic Woman was on TV again recently, um, uh, last year or the year before but uh, she was a sort of spin-off from the Six Million Dollar Man, and sometimes, as you can see at the bottom, they were in activities together, uh, sort of a cooperative uh, crossover, corporate crossover kinds of things. So, uh, and the idea, Six Million Dollars used to be a lot of money, I know it's not anymore, but uh, Six Million Dollars was how much Steve Austin, on the left-hand side, owed to the Office of Scientific Investigation because they were the folks who had rebuilt him with this technology. Well. We've got some real life uh, cyborgs uh, or bionic humans. Um, we can talk if we wanted to about technologies like um, uh, cardiac technologies, implantable uh, pacemakers for instance, or left ventricular assist devices, or in fact, uh, if you take a look at number five in the bottom left corner, uh, something that's designed to be a permanent replacement for the heart so that we don't need heart transplants anymore. There have been attempts also 
uh, with regard to technology such as insulin pumps, which on the left-hand side you can see in early iterations were quite elaborate kinds of enterprises. Now uh, they're, they're quite tiny devices. My mother has one, and you can barely see she's got a sort of bump uh, under her bra strap, uh, which is where she uh, wears the device. And this is uh, giving her a basal uh, level of, of insulin over the course of the day, and then measuring spikes, uh, or uh, whether uh, increases or whether peaks or valleys in her uh, insulin level so that it can administer doses of insulin uh, in order to make sure that her blood sugar maintains uh, a relatively stable balance within a normal range of variation. Uh, I wouldn't say this has made her a new person. I mean, it's made her a little whinier than she used to be because it beeps all the time and it drives her crazy. And she calls me in Arizona from Montreal and says, why won't this machine stop? And I tell her I'm not that kind of doctor. I have no idea. Uh, uh, Really, she's very disappointed uh, that I can't help her with this stuff. But nonetheless, uh, it hasn't sort of changed her personality in any way. But at some level, you get to devices that might actually have a much more elaborate kind of uh, in, uh, interaction with the human form and the human psyche. And so these are some uh, examples uh, of individuals. These are two real life people. On the left hand side is uh, uh, Jesse uh, Sullivan, and on the right-hand side, Claudia Mitchell. And uh, these are both individuals who were fitted uh, with a prosthetic arm through some advances uh, made in a variety of domains, but really culminating in this device developed at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And the idea here is to hijack the muscles, the muscle fibers that are left over after a limb amputation, uh, and as it were, channel the perception that the individual has of a phantom limb uh, and moving that phantom limb, uh, hijack that, that sensation, hijack that uh, motivation to move the, uh, the phantom limb into moving a prosthetic arm. And again, uh, in this issue of National Geographic, there's a significant uh, feature, uh, a significant part of the feature is to focus on uh, a woman who uh, had a car accident, lost her arm in 2006, and has been dealing with a variety of these uh, prosthetic devices ever since. The drawback with most of these prosthetic devices is that the control that they afford you is quite gross. You know, you get some elaborate, exaggerated movements, which for some folks is better than nothing, but at the same time, it's not the precise level of control that you'd like to be able to have eventually. Uh, certainly, if, if somebody with a prosthetic arm uh, who was a fabulous concert pianist, uh, sorry, concert violinist, were asked to uh, play the violin with this prosthetic arm, you can be darn sure uh, that she would not be making the same beautiful music as before. But a goal in this field is to be able to create uh, the capacity to control in that very fine-tuned way so as to be able to um, uh, really generate more than just gross movement, actual precise movement that would uh, be very useful for uh, individuals who've lost limbs. Now, we've also seen a development of a variety of neural devices. This is where we get into the stuff that I'm a little bit more uh, interested in exploring with you, and just a couple of examples that have uh, a quite long history. Um, I'm going to talk about devices first that are uh, effectively input brain machine or brain computer interfaces, by which I mean the idea is to take something from the world and to put it into the brain. Uh, so a percept. Uh, a visual perception, for instance, take that, uh, you know, what it is I see as I look out up, up, upon all of your sleepy eyes, post-lunch sleepy eyes, uh, and that image is then, you know, transmitted into my brain through my eyes. If I couldn't see, one possibility would be to have uh, a technology that enables uh, that, uh, the transference of that percept, that thing in the world, into my brain. There are also output BMIs, where the idea is to take what's happening in my brain and put it out into the world. And I'm going to start with input and then talk about uh, output or hybrid devices, which do both of those. So the standard example of uh, an auditory, uh, standard example of a neural uh, brain-computer interface that has a long history is the auditory uh, BCI, known as the cochlear implant. And cochlear implants were developed in the 1970s. Uh, and I think now we're at the point at which uh, uh, over 100,000 and maybe close now to 200,000 people worldwide have received uh, cochlear implant transplants. Not without some interesting controversy. Uh, there are some folks in the deaf community uh, for whom uh, this is a, an absolute godsend now that they're able to, they don't hear in exactly the same way that we do, but they're able to train themselves to hear what it is that the uh, cochlear device is implanting in the brain 
to translate into that into something that into a meaningful noise. Um, they can't quite hear music the way we do, they can understand speech and so on. And so for some folks this is a godsend. For other folks it's just the opposite. This is, uh, an, uh, if you like, um, uh, an attempt to rob, uh, as it were, uh, deaf folks of the accomplishments they've made independently of their hearing. And so there has been some political controversy about this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a, in a few minutes, and I'm not going to go through the technology. I'm just going to move us into a different area where we haven't seen as much controversy, but nonetheless there are interesting issues on the horizon, I think. And this is the idea of developing visual brain-computer interfaces, which either deal with the retina, the optic nerve, uh, or uh, um, uh, the surface of the, cortic uh, the cortical surface uh, in order to be able to uh, transmit an image from the world typically through a video camera into uh, the brain of the individual so that he or she can see. Uh, and so there's sort of the typical examples <clears throat> where you've got a camera mounted on, the, on a pair of glasses that transmits an image wirelessly to a device that's implanted uh, somewhere in the eye and through that or there are a variety of different kinds of uh, of, of visions of this, literally visions of this, uh, individuals are able to process, not necessarily with any sort of fine grain precision, but nonetheless able to process shapes or colors in the world and see. Now, uh, as it turns out, the only people who seem to be really interested in these technologies are blind people who lost their vision at some point during their lifetime. Folks who've been blind since birth seem to have almost no interest in these technologies. Uh, I suspect, and I supervised a student last year, a blind student who did the first empirical study trying to explore uh, blind people's attitudes toward these technologies. Uh, uh, what Ariel Silverman and I were able to determine is that uh, folks who've lost their vision have almost all of their memories as visual memories, uh, whereas folks who have never been able to see don't have any visual memories. So they, as it were, don't know what they're missing, but also don't see any need. Uh, don't perceive any need whatsoever to undergo an invasive procedure. But what was especially interesting to us is that Ariel and I asked the individuals who participated in the study whether if we had a magical pill that had zero side effects and one main effect, the main effect being to enable you immediately to see or gradually to see without any sort of serious psychological uh, uh, ramifications, would you take this pill? And uh, only about 40% uh, uh, or less of individuals who had been blind since birth uh, would have been interested in taking that pill, as distinct from uh, sort of 98 or 99 percent of people. The ones who, dis who said no, I think, didn't believe us that it would have no side effects. And now, of course, it was a totally make-believe example, and all of these things do have side effects. One very interesting one, one of the individuals who's undergone uh, surgery for a bionic eye as part of uh, some initial testing here was described in an article in the New York Times as uh, finally having the freedom uh, and the mobility to get around New York City without relying on a white cane or a dog any longer. And so this was quite celebrated in the story, but the story also had a very interesting um, uh, sideline to it, which is that though he could discern uh, uh, some colors and shapes in the world, uh, he wasn't any longer able to distinguish between an open subway car door and the space between two subway cars. And as you can imagine, that's a very important discrimination to be able to make, right? One of them you get happily on the train, the other you fall to your demise between the two cars. If he'd had a cane or if he'd had a dog, he would never make that mistake. The attempt uh, to see uh, literally, by using these kinds of devices, uh, generated at least some challenges, again, until we get some uh, finer control over these devices. Now, other kinds of things happen uh, just up the road at the Cleveland Clinic, for instance, they've made some very interesting uh, progress with deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation uh, is used typically uh, in individuals who have Parkinson's disease uh, and uh, who are refractive to treatment, who, who don't respond well to L-DOPA or other drugs. Uh, and the idea is that by um, uh, inserting an electrode quite deep into the brain and then stimulating the brain, it's possible to alleviate the motor tremors and some of the other motor deficits associated with Parkinson's disease. What's especially interesting about this is we have no idea how it works. Uh, uh, and so that said, it clearly does. Uh, and so there have been a lot of hypotheses about what's going on. One thing that's really interesting is sometimes just implanting the wire without ever turning it on can alleviate the symptoms. So it suggests that something's going on there, even independently of the stimulation. But nonetheless, uh, now it looks like there have been 
uh, some very interesting case reports of the side effects that people experience. So imagine that you've um, uh, always been quite uh, or especially since you developed Parkinson's disease, been quite risk averse, you're not gonna be getting up because you're worried about falling down and so on. You can imagine if you see an immediate alleviation of your symptoms through the deep brain stimulator, that you might then become a little bit more impulsive, a little bit less careful. And so people uh, have actually taken quite serious falls because they're not able to integrate uh, into the new body, that sort of non-tremor body that they inhabit. Uh, uh, post deep brain stimulation. At the same time, we've also seen some very interesting examples of changes in personality. Uh, so people who were uh, shy become uh, aggressive. People who were uh, outgoing become uh, shy. People who were friendly become nasty jerks and so on. And this uh, does raise some concern. Uh, and in fact, some families have requested that uh, that uh, the Cleveland Clinic or another institute remove the deep brain stimulator uh, because they don't like the new person that grandpa has become. So uh, very interesting stuff happening there and especially now there have been attempts to move toward uh, not just using it to treat uh, Parkinson's disease but to treat epilepsy and also to treat some psychiatric conditions such as uh, depression and bipolar disorder. All right, so this uh, takes us into a slightly different realm, but nonetheless, the idea is here, uh, again, putting a percept from the world into the brain of an organism. Here you've got uh, a rat, uh, sometimes referred to now as a rat bot, uh, who has got a microelectrode implanted in his brain, and uh, there are two things that are happening with this rat. One is that he or she is receiving uh, a, a stimulus, so the left uh, whisker is tweaked, which suggests that there's something there, so the rat should turn right. And so that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is when the rat turns right, when you want him to, he gets a little jolt in the pleasure center of his brain, sort of like a little tiny, I know this is uh, sort of racy, but a little tiny rat orgasm, right? He gets this little tiny jolt of something that feels really good and it makes him want to keep doing the right thing. So when the right whisker tweaks, he then goes left and so on. Uh, and it's amazing, as you see on the left-hand side there, you can actually get the mouse not just to run a sort of um, uh, obstacle course in one dimension, but in three, or two dimensions, but actually in three dimensions, climbing up over things, going through walls, uh, well, not walls, going through doors, uh, and so on. And the thought is that these remote controlled rats could be useful in military uh, settings, for instance, uh, so we don't have to go into caves in Afghanistan, we can instead send the rat bots out before us, and so on. Uh, but there have also been some thoughts that the same kinds of technologies might be useful for um, uh, altering the behavior of human beings as well. And so uh, sometimes this is referred to in Department of Defense circles as substituted decisional authority, which is a fancy way of saying uh, mind control, right? Uh, so nonetheless, interesting stuff. And this generated some significant controversy when it emerged a few years ago. So I want to move quickly through a couple of other kinds of technologies before I get to the, um, the analysis. And it's going to be very short and hopefully have some time for questions. But uh, there have been some folks who've been trying to develop other kinds of devices where the idea is not just to take something from the world and put it in the brain, but to take something from the brain and bring it out to the world. And this is um, uh, Neural Signals is the name of the company uh, based in Atlanta. And uh, the idea behind, uh, or the main idea behind this, uh, Phil Kennedy, who's the CEO, he's an MD, uh, has been developing uh, what's called the neurotrophic electrode. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, to deal with patients who have locked-in syndrome, patients who are entirely fully cognitively aware but are incapable of moving, incapable of talking, incapable of communicating with the outside world in any way, as it were, they're locked in to their body. There's an image of that in the top left-hand corner. That's the uh, logo of Neural Signals. The thought is, if these people are fully cognitively aware, we just need to find a way to tap into them inside that locked-in box and let them out again. And so um, this is work that's been ongoing. It's not been super successful yet, but the idea is there. Uh, the idea has been well developed in non-human animals, and now they're trying to translate it into uh, successes in humans. Now, if you want to, again, go back to pop culture, you can take a look at Clint Eastwood's beautiful documentary. I'm not, I'm kidding, it's not a documentary, um, but uh, this is now, I think, 25 years old, where he had to steal a, a Russian fighter plane that was uh, rigged by the Russians to respond to the thoughts, uh, signals read from the brain of the pilot. So the pilot didn't have to use his hands anymore, he just had to think, and all that Clint Eastwood had to do to steal the plane, aside from infiltrating uh, the Russian military, was, as he put it, think in Russian. 
And as long as he thought in Russian, the plane would understand him. Now, we have uh, maybe gone a little bit more toward understanding aspects of the uh, neural architecture and neural signaling that takes place. So we know we don't have to think in Russian. Just thinking might be enough. But how do we actually get that thought process from the brain into the world? Uh, in an article in Scientific American in 2002, which looks unbelievably quaint now when you consider, look at the size of that backpack computer. When you consider what Steve Jobs was hanging around with yesterday with his iPad device uh, and all the cool things you can do now, this is archaic. But nonetheless, the thought is an implanted device in the brain of somebody who's got uh, some form of paralysis would enable that person through thought alone to control the chair, to control uh, a cursor on a screen, and so on. And this is an image that was um, actually realized, but it looks even uh, more weird in real life uh, than it did in that picture. This was an article published a, a couple of years ago in Nature, uh, and the story uh, involves this gentleman, Matt Nagel, uh, who had been in a knife fight and had experienced some serious uh, paralysis. And uh, he had a device implanted. This is called the BrainGate device. And you can see where it says A up top, uh, the, the size of the device compared to a penny. Uh, that device is implanted quite deep in his brain, as you can see. In, it looks like B, and it's uh, implanted in the brain. In, uh, you can see where it is in C. It's got a wire that's attached to it. The wire goes up to a bolt that sits on top of his head. Uh, and the bolt then is attached to a cable, as you can see, in the left-hand side. And what uh, Nagel is able to do is, by by thinking uh, about what he wants to do, his thoughts somehow or other, uh, somehow or other, it's, it's not quite magic, but nonetheless, a variety of, of processors in the backpack computer uh, that uh, translate what it is he's thinking into uh, movement on the screen. And the way he puts it is, uh, I can't put it into words. It's just I use my brain. I just thought it. I said, cursor, go up to the top right. And it did. And now I can control it all over the screen. It will give me a sense of independence. So he's able to respond to emails and do various other kinds of things as a function of this. Unfortunately for uh, cyber kinetics, the system, the company that developed the BrainGate system, uh, they've now folded uh, due to a lack of investment. They haven't been able to move this to the next phase. And so it's not entirely clear where we're going to go. Some folks think we ought to go here uh, to a new uh, iteration of human beings who are considerably more enhanced uh, and more able to deal with the world. So you don't have to worry about having a Blackberry on your hip and those weird glasses with the video camera. Instead, it's all just built into us. And you don't have to worry about growing organs in sheep uh, because we've got spare organs already grown in our body, under our skin, ready to be harvested as necessary. And so again, this is a fictional representation uh, uh, by some futurists, uh, a, a particular futurist artist, a transhumanist artist uh, called Natasha Vitamore, which must be a made up name. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this was uh, d uh, on display a few years ago, and lots of other folks are interested. So why is this interesting from an ethical, legal, or policy kind of perspective? Well, I, I'm going to try to tell you that story in two or three minutes, because I know I'm out of time. Um, I want to first appeal to this uh, figure on the right-hand side here, um, which is referred to as the Uncanny Valley. And this was developed by a Japanese roboticist, uh, Masahiro Mori. And the idea is that uh, in representations of of uh, organisms or entities according to their similarity to humans, there's a point at which uh, the growing similarity to humans is just fine with us, but then immediately drops off and then, uh, and then slowly rises again. And that uh, the, the dropping off, the, the valley that's created by that dropping off, was referred to uh, by Mori uh, by a phrase that translates uh, more or less as the uncanny valley. And the thought is that. Um, we're OK with industrial robots, because they look nothing like us, even though they take our jobs and so on. Well, they don't take my job, but they take other people's jobs and so on. Uh, we don't have to worry so much uh, about those. Uh, stuffed animals are kind of cute. Robots that look sort of human-like are OK. But there gets to be a point, and this was uh, Masahiro's lesson, is that if they start to look too much like humans, people start to get a little bit freaked out by them. And there's that re uh, repulsion or repugnance that people feel. And uh, this is captured, uh, you know, as you can see, when it dips below the line here, uh, by a corpse or a zombie. These are the kinds of things that we might have this kind of reaction to, which can be explained evolutionarily. It can be explained psychologically and so on. It doesn't make it any less real, obviously. Healthy people we're OK with. But there's this gap, this uncanny valley. And I think some of the, the variables that are relevant when we're thinking about 
uh, humanizing animals, making them too much like humans, or animalizing humans, making us too much like non-human animals, or with cyborgs or bionic creatures, humanizing machines, or uh, what I haven't, which I haven't been talking about, the sort of robotics area, but also mechanizing humans by embedding us uh, or integrating us with a variety of uh, mechanistic properties. Uh, some of the relevant variables are things like, how does this thing appear to us? If it looks fully normal and we have no reason to suspect otherwise, that might not be an issue. Uh, how well integrated a technology is, how well integrated it is functionally, uh, whether there's an extension of function beyond what we're typically capable of doing, and what the purpose is for uh, for doing this or for uh, sort of humanizing the machine or mechanizing the human or animalizing the uh, human or humanizing the animal, the purpose seems to matter as well. So we've got this in the background, and there is some discomfort raised by Piccinini's art. There's some discomfort raised by some of the cyborg technologies. Certainly there's some discomfort uh, raised by the whole area of sex and robots, which I won't talk about, but you can imagine is a kind of racy field. Um, with uh, here are just two books with the, both of the same title, Almost Human. On the left-hand side, you get some thought, uh, some uh, insight into the, what's going on in the, the uh, minds of baboons. On the right-hand side, uh, you have my colleague Lee Gutkin's uh, recent book on making robots think, where you've got uh, these creatures that are sim uh, similar to humans in interesting ways. And uh, there's certainly been some attempt uh, and certainly uh, still continues to be a strong interest in reducing the gaps between these kinds of creatures, whether machines or animals, and humans. Now, at the same time, there's a persistence of what I call irony here. And uh, Michael Korist, who is an individual who has always been hard of hearing, who became fully deaf as a young adult and immediately sought out a cochlear implant, um, wrote a, a very nice, very touching, very funny, moving book about this, subtitled My Journey Back to the Hearing World. But the subtitle of the second edition of the book has a much more interesting uh, ring to it, How Becoming Part commu Computer Made Me More Human. And the idea here is that he's able now to engage in the world in a way that he wasn't able to as a deaf person, and this has made him better off than he was before. As you can imagine, uh, Chorus is a kind of controversial figure because there are folks in the deaf community who absolutely reject out of hand uh, these cochlear devices. But nonetheless, this gives us a sense of the, of the diversity of opinion here. And so we've got a challenge. I'm not going to go through the particular ethical issues, but just to say the research looks to be very promising in various kinds of ways, while at the same time also raises serious moral concerns for a variety of folks who are concerned either about things like um, uh, drilling holes into the head or cutting the top of the head off non-human primates in order to inject uh, the microelectrodes, uh, who are concerned about the personality changes that might be engendered by deep brain stimulation or by the implantation of other kinds of electrodes, who are worried about the, uh, the potential of cowboys with the cybrid technologies who are worried about uh, what it might mean to try to grow a human brain in the uh, body or the head of a non-human animal. There are some uh, ethical concerns. And so even though there's promise, there's also danger. Uh, at the same time, many of the things I've been talking about, I mean, some of them are actually make-believe, but many of them are just seem make-believe. They're not very well understood by those of us on the outside, but they have a long history, and many of them are already in clinical experimentation. So there's reason to believe we'll see it at some point relatively soon. And so we've got a challenge before us. Uh, we are, I imagine, a diverse pluralistic society. Uh, sometimes we're just uh, a divided society in two groups, but typically we're more diverse than that. Uh, and we've got competing visions of the good. And so how do we begin to grapple with issues raised by advances in chimera making and cyborg making uh, that are being developed for a wide variety of purposes? And I should point out that though I'm interested in the domain of controversial science, I should point out that there is an important distinction between uh, calling something controversial just as a descriptive term, lots of people find this controversial, and actually making the judgment that something is indeed morally controversial. And I haven't made that distinction yet, but it's something that might come up in the discussion. Now, there are all sorts of ways that we can respond to this as regular people or as scientists. We could deny that there's any controversy at all and just sort of ignore it. Uh, sorry, just sort of... Um, uh, you know, pretend it doesn't exist, we could ignore it altogether, or we could dogmatically 
uh, insist that there's nothing to worry about. And the denial, uh, where we seem, you know, there's no controversy here. We're happily in favor of the technology. In the dogmatism, uh, we are simply opposed to it, thumbs down all the time. And in ignorance, we might go either way. These are not good strategies. Scientists, similarly, can develop uh, these kinds of responses. Scientists might deny the existence of a controversy or deny its persistence. They might ignore uh, the idea altogether, thinking that it's not their job to worry about whether something's controversial. Or they might dogmatically uh, debate critics all the while assuming that the critics are obviously wrong and they're right from the beginning. And lots of scientists, unfortunately, fall into this category, not because of the, uh, you know, anything inherent in science, but because of the way we breed scientists to sort of uh, assume that science is the only epistemological game in town. If something can be scientifically justified, you don't have to worry about any other kind of objection to it. Scientific justification is enough. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time when scientists engage dogmatically uh, or they, uh, they go into a kind of hiding about it, the end result is some significant conflict, uh, headbutting that might happen uh, on the part of regular people and scientists. We saw this with debates about human embryonic stem cell research. We've seen it with debates about uh, ethics with non, uh, the ethics of research with non-human primates, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So these are all bad strategies as well. So what could we do to do a better job? Well, I mean, I'm hoping not to tell you the answer because I don't know it. Uh, I'm hoping instead that you'll be able to give me uh, some thoughts about this, whether immediately or you know, by email afterwards. But I think that as scientists, uh, we've got an obligation to justify our research transparently and capably in a way that recognizes that there might be significant social opposition, that the scientific justification isn't enough, but the scientific justification nonetheless is important. I think as citizens, we've got an obligation to learn a little bit more about science than we currently know, and to learn a little bit more about ethics than we currently know, and not engage in the denial, the ignorance, or the dogmatism uh, of our forebears. And I think at the same time, as ethicists, we've got to find ways to create the spaces in which it's possible to have productive discussions uh, with people who are well-intentioned but obviously disagree in a way that enables us to maintain, if you like, a kind of moral accountability to each other. We don't do a good job of this in this country. I used to think we did a good job of it in Canada. It turns out we don't do a good job in Canada either. Uh, it's not clear that anybody does a really good job of this yet, uh, having productive conversations about uh, morally difficult issues. But I think we've got the challenge before us. Some resources that might be useful, the DEMOS group in the UK, uh, has published a brochure on see-through science that they think would be helpful in this regard. I think it might be, uh, but we really have a long way to go. And I'm going to wrap up just with, uh, with two quick slides. I mean, I think at some point, if we bear in mind that scientists are as good or as bad as anybody else, in other words, there's as much diversity in the person amongst the personality of scientists as we see anywhere else in the world, we can understand that science is generally good, but it might also be bad in particular ways. There's, uh, it might be either bad in itself or dangerous in its application. Uh, there are lots of different uh, values. Scientific uh, or epistemo the epistemological value of science is only one of several important values. Uh, the more people understand science, the more likely they are to be supportive, but at the same time, the more likely they are to ask good, hard questions about how uh, not to get uh, or so sort of to be sort of intelligently skeptical about it, how not to get swept up in the rhetoric. And I think that if we can find ways to work together as scientists and citizens, uh, this might be a much more uh, useful approach than what we currently have. That said, it's hard to really do this in practice. You have a variety of settings in which it might take place. Fora like this are an interesting opportunity, especially if the speaker doesn't spend an hour going on and on and on and leave some time for uh, everybody else to be able to contribute. But nonetheless, I think uh, at the end of the day, the goal that we have has to be for a productive conversation. We might not all agree at the end of the day, but if we agree to disagree in, uh, on the basis of good information and a real appreciation of the pull of the other's position, that can be enough to keep us morally accountable to each other. And that might just be good enough because all the alternatives are so much more, as Stanley Cavell put it, so much more brutal. Uh, what else we do? If we don't sort of have good productive di disagreements, what do we have instead? Well, fist fights or Fox News or you know whatever else. None of this is the right way forward. So hopefully we might get some progress through a more dialogical uh, approach that I'm envisioning. It's a romantic vision to be sure, uh, but I don't think that should disqualify it. Thanks.
Jason, thank you so much for uh, equal parts disturbing and entertaining us, but also, above all, stimulating our, our uh, thoughts about this difficult topic. Some of you, I know, may have to depart. We're going to do Q&A, uh, but I thought we could just have a moment's disruption for those who need to uh, step out, if you could do so now. And those who have the time to stay, we will now do Q&A. So does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Oh, there's a microphone. I'm sorry. It would seem to me if you ever really want to explore the outer parts of the solar system, you're going to have to change the type of individual that makes the trip. The average human being would not survive a trip to Mars. His bones would not be there. Or if, unfortunately, there was a solar flare that took out your Blackberry, it would probably take him out, too. Indeed. And so I think that, uh, you know, at no point am I trying to suggest that we oughtn't to be doing these uh, various kinds of uh, developments, although, you know, we might want to debate whether it's a good idea to explore the outer reaches of the solar system. But absolutely, I mean, there are certain things that humans are really good at and certain things that we're really bad at. And um, one of the most interesting folks I've talked to about this topic is Roberta Bondar, who was the first... Uh, neurologist in space. Um, she's celebrated more for being the first woman in space. Uh, she was the first Canadian woman astronaut neurologist in space. And, you know, there are like hundreds of public schools in Canada named after her and so on. Uh, but she's been really interested in two things. The effects of space travel on the uh, neurological development and maintenance of the astronauts, but also what kinds of enhancements would be required in order to make certain kinds of space flight actually possible. And uh, as the gentleman suggests, these would be, uh, as, you might not, as you might imagine, pretty dramatic, because uh, these are the sorts of things that not just average humans, even above average humans couldn't do. Uh, uh, maybe Oliver the human Z could do it, but not necessarily the rest of us. Yeah, do it very much style. Of course, if he started to smoke a cigar in space, presumably that would not be a good thing. But <laughs> yes, I'm in the fuchsia shirt. Uh, recently, I've been reading about uh, things neuroscientists have been discovering about how to influence your thinking processes without you realizing it. Uh, two entities are particularly interested in this. One is the Department of Defense, so-called. The other is Madison Avenue. And I wondered if you, uh, I wondered if you could uh, talk about how this might be dealt with. Yeah. So uh, no, I can't talk about that. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I don't know how to deal with it. Um, the consortium that Dr. French introduced immediately at the beginning, this what's now called SET bonds, the Consortium on Emerging Technologies, National Security, no, Military Operations and National Security, is designed specifically to explore those questions from the perspective of the Department of Defense. One of the things that we have managed to do with that consortium is partner pretty well with folks from the Naval Academy, uh, folks from elsewhere in uh, the Department of Defense in order to get some insider insight into what's actually happening and what some of the motivations are. As you might imagine, there's not typically a whole lot of interest in the kinds of things that ethicists and regular people have to say from a defense perspective. I do take a little bit of solace in the thought that the new director of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, I think it's what's called DARPA, is uh, a woman who's very much interested in exploring some of the policy dimensions of the work uh, that DARPA sponsors and funds. So it could be very interesting to see whether we might actually be able to move forward. Because one of the things that uh, Jonathan Moreno, who's written a book uh, called Mind Wars, in which he explores exactly the question you uh, bring up, and I strongly recommend the book, uh, Moreno says one of the things that's very desperately uh, in short supply is uh, the oxygen of transparency. We have no idea what's happening behind those doors. We don't know what's happening in marketing departments, and we don't know what's happening uh, in the Department of Defense. Uh, it's possible to get some insights in various ways by including the right kinds of people. Then again, I'm Canadian. And so one of the guys who came and gave a talk here in this very room, uh, I'm Canadian. There was another Canadian in the room, and there was an Australian guy. And this meant, well, he might have been able to show a few more had we not been there, but he's only able to show two of about 100 slides that he had with him because we're not class of, we don't have the right uh, security clearance in order to be able to see what, uh, what his company, uh, which is under contract with the Department of Defense, is actually developing. So until we have a, better, uh, a bit more insight into what's happening, it's going to be difficult. Our strategy has been, though, to engage some of these folks, to engage the scientists who are doing the work, to engage the bioengineers, 
to engage the stem cell biologists, to engage the folks who are doing the work, to get them thinking a little bit uh, more themselves about what it is that they're doing, why they're doing it, how well justified it is, what might be some potential misuses of their, uh, of their research, and what are some ways that they might insulate against some of the misuses of their research. Uh, it's a hugely difficult, long process, but we're trying. Hi. Uh, so I don't want to go too far into the details on this, but I actually have a friend who uh, has undergone the, I don't know, I don't know if implantation is the right term, the deep brain stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, and he brought up an interesting ethical point with me of, uh, based on the tests that they've done sort of before and after, they've noticed that he's gotten smarter after uh, the implantation. Uh, so I guess my question was first, uh, sort of what are your thoughts on something like this? And second, I, I can think of some interesting scenarios when this would become uh, publicly an issue, and I was wondering your thoughts on those as well. Yes, certainly. So, I mean, I suspect that had my mother had access to this back in the day, uh, she would have been much happier for me not to be a philosopher. She would have found ways to make me smart enough to do something actually useful in the world. Uh, and, and, I mean, I remember when she cried when I told her I was going to, to be a philosopher. Uh, nonetheless, there, it, it's not just, I mean, deep brain stimulation, this would be a, a sort of an accidental side effect of the technology. Presumably it wasn't implanted precisely to improve his intelligence right? Um, there are some drugs that have been developed uh, that might have exactly uh, that kind of goal, cognitive enhancement kinds of goals, whether by increasing our processing speed, uh, by increasing our capacity to remember extraneous facts, uh, by um, uh, increasing our uh, mental acuity over longer periods of time so that we don't get tired and so on. As you can imagine, the military is very interested in these kinds of technologies, but who else might be interested? in Parents. Right? Especially parents whose kids they want to go to the Case Westerns of the world instead of the Arizona State Universities of the world. Uh, parents who want their kids to, I, that's not on tape, right? Uh, parents, it, uh, that's because they don't know how excellent Arizona State University is as a fantastically, as a leading research one institution in the United States and globally. Uh, the, uh, you know, but, but in particular, parents who are concerned about getting their kids on waiting lists for certain kinds of daycares or, or, uh, or uh, early childhood education programs very, very early on, you know, prior to conception and so on. Uh, you can imagine there will be a variety of factors that might drive people to undergo these kinds of, tech, uh, of enhancements. And we've certainly seen it not with intelligence, perhaps just the opposite in the realm of sports uh, with, you know, folks who are very keen to take uh, performance enhancing drugs in order to become that much better at hitting a ball over a wall or various other kinds of things that professional athletes do uh, and make a, a bunch of money doing uh, along the way even if they don't get into the Hall of Fame afterwards. And uh, so I, there has been a huge amount of interesting uh, work on the topic of enhancement. In fact, Max Melman at the law school here is one of the folks who's been uh, fantastically uh, uh, well informed about what's been happening with debates about enhancement technologies. Uh, but I think you raise a very interesting uh, alternative to the stuff that we typically focus on. We typically focus on uh, intentional uh, uh, enhancement. And this is an example of, a, of cognitive enhancement as a side effect of a curative uh, a technology deployed for curative reasons. And so you can imagine that very quickly, rather than being a, a treatment of last resort for Parkinson's disease, this might actually be uh, a treatment, that the, the first thing that anybody tries, because if it works for alleviating the symptoms of Parkinson's or depression or whatever, and also makes you smarter, you'd be stupid not to go for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Nicole has the microphone, so she calls on you, not me. Uh, I was struck by, by the way you discussed how the debate should be proceeding, uh, because what you seem to be asking for on questions of the role of science and limits on science is something we do not have in any way on any public policy issue whatsoever, ever. And, and I just found myself wondering why science should be any different, why we should expect more in a debate about science than a debate about, say, healthcare reform or invading Iraq or any of the other things we do as a matter of public policy. And I could think of two things. One was that you actually were asking for something beyond the realm of public policy. In other words, maybe government isn't really involved here necessarily. Uh, 
but I'm not sure that really makes a difference. <laughs> uh, and the other might be that, well, because as scientists, you're expecting something better from them than from other actors in the political system, which if you follow, uh, say, the appropriations process and the arguments about who should get so much money, how much money, scientists don't appear to be any different from anybody else there either, including overselling cures and the NIH, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, why... Why is there any hope for what you're talking about? Because from the standpoint of thinking about public debate, you know, I don't know of an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, so I think that, that uh, that's less of an indictment of the approach that I want to take and more of a diagnosis of a much deeper problem uh, that's persistent throughout contemporary American and other societies. Um, you're right, we don't have any role models here to follow. Uh, and it certainly is the case that I would recommend uh, considerably more appropriate uh, kinds of engagement exercises with regular people, with ethicists, with political scientists and economists and so on over things like healthcare reform and some of the other topics that you mentioned, uh, rather than the, the sort of standard approaches that uh, most government actors, most bureaucrats, uh, uh, mandarins and so on would, would, uh, would, would tend to take. Um, now that said, uh, do I see a role for government in here? Potentially, but I'm not theorizing that role at this point in time. There are some folks who do. The folks involved in the democracy and science movements, for instance, are very keen on this stuff. Uh, the DEMOS group that I mentioned is much more interested in getting regular people, sort of mobilizing regular people to think hard about important topics. Science just happens to be one of the very many things they're interested in. Uh, and I think that's the same, I, I want to make the same kind of claim here. Science is one of the many things I'm interested in. Uh, and one of the things that I worry about is that uh, science has been uh, in some ways insulated. Uh, scientists in particular have been insulated from a, uh, from a if you like, uh, the, the decision-making process uh, that leads to uh, the support of their work, whether we're talking about at a very high level, whether or not to double the NIH budget, or at a low level, whether or not to fund this particular project. Uh, scientists have typically been, they've played a relatively insulated role. They propose a project to other people just like them, and those people approve the project, and then when they're asked to justify it to regular people, they promise outrageous things, like that they'll cure every disease under the sun, thanks to just this you know, little tiny investment in human genomics or this little tiny investment in uh, neural technologies or whatnot. And I think that that's not an appropriate starting point or, nor an appropriate end point for the ways in, in which scientists ought to engage with us. Uh, so I have a, a sort of, I, I put scientists a little bit on a pedestal here simply because they've been excused from uh, a justification enterprise that I think so many of the rest of us have to uh, participate in. And I guess as a philosopher ethicist whose job is, a life, is as a life sciences professor, I spend a lot of time justifying my very existence and that everybody else in my unit doesn't have to because they're scientists, therefore they should exist in that unit and so on. And I worry that, that's, that, that there's a kind of complacency that gets built in there. But in particular, what I worry about in the US context is that I, I suspect that despite arguments that the NIH budget needs to double again and then double again and then double again and so on, as many scientists maintain, uh, we're actually reaching uh, a saturation point that is where regular people are sick and tired of pouring money into mouse models of schizophrenia without actually seeing any new developments that might lead to treatments or cures for schizophrenia. And so I suspect, and this might just be alarmist on my part, that it's only a matter of time before the public processes that lead to increases in science funding grind to a halt and scientists are left struggling. Now scientists can help themselves, I think, by doing a better job justifying their work and by engaging regular people. I so too, I also think that uh, you know, various other agents in various other public policy debates have a, uh, could take on additional responsibilities and do a better job of, in, uh, of engaging citizens or engaging stakeholders or whatever. Now that said, engaging citizens and engaging stakeholders is a funny little rhetorical kind of thing that lots of people like to talk about. What it actually means in practice is entirely uh, uh, a black box, really. Uh, and very often what looks like public engagement really turns out to be public relations rather than anything uh, deeper than that. So in this regard, they, I then want to appeal to folks who are engaged in more of the deliberative democracy uh, movement uh, and the communicative action kinds of folks who uh, I think are trying very hard to theorize but also to role model and operationalize or implement to use a less fancy word, uh, a variety of ways uh, in which we could do a much better job of uh, deliberation about policy options than we currently do in this country or anywhere else. I think uh, we have time for one, one more question uh, in Zoom. Hey, now uh, I need to feed this gentleman who has not had lunch. We all did, but <laughs> he didn't. 
Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I noticed a, an asymmetry in the way you presented the material on chimeras versus um, the cyborgs. Okay, good. I want to know about this. Um, so in the case of the, of the, the mechanical inter interventions in the melding of human and machine, I think, I think it was a little more obvious to the audience why somebody might want to try to do that. They all had some sort of more obvious curative goal. In the case of the chimeras, I, it, it was, you know, I, you talked about some scientific research, but a lot of your examples and slides had to do with like artists and other kind of enterprises that aren't really about um, creating chimeras for some kind of broader social good. And I think it should be pointed out that here at Case, we have lots of human animal chimeras. They're uh, mouse models of, you know, the human immune system that, that we use in AIDS research, cancer models with human cancer cell lines in the, in the animals. There are lots, and they've been around for like 20 years or more, right? right. So, so in the case of chimeras, of course, you know, the way scientists like to think about their utility is that they re they're only being created for uh, biomedical research that we hope eventually will help humans, whether it's pre preclinical translational research in animal models of disease before you go into humans. Um, so, so I thought that asymmetry was interesting. But yeah, it, so it's, yeah. it's, it's an artifact of the presentation rather than uh, anything else. And I'm glad you pointed it out because, um, you know, the, the first sort of extended, well, the first two extended pieces I did on the justification of work with non-human, uh, uh, part human chimeras were published in science journals primarily because, as you point out, there's a long history of using uh, whether transgenic models or chimeric models uh, in the biomedical sciences uh, more broadly. The stuff that's gotten a lot of attention uh, goes beyond the sort of onco-mouse kinds of thing and then focuses on um, especially in the context of a very politicized stem cell uh, debate uh, about implanting stem cells into non-human uh, uh, animals, uh, basically as a way to bridge the gap between the non-human animal on the one hand, into which uh, we're transplanting the cells that we eventually want to transplant into humans, but we need more warrant from the work with the chimeras before we can go ahead into the human well, cases. I, I mean, I'm aware of your work. In no, that no, no, I know. Yeah, right. No, so, so uh, I think absolutely this is, you're right, I should spend more time uh, paying attention to that here. But, but, but I just one more comment. Yeah. So in the area of technology, I think you know, in terms of public engagement, how does the public uh, engage in that? I think right now, uh, you know, the public engages by voting with their dollars. They're buying iPods, they're buying technologies that actually fundamentally transform the way we, we as you pointed out, interact with one another. Mm -hmm and privacy issues and all that get transformed. Uh, and I think that's a much more serious area that needs more discussion than maybe lab animals where you might have maybe a few hundred cases in the US that don't directly affect people the way that maybe technological advances like iPods and, and you know um, cell phones actually change civil society. Um, so I, I thought there was that kind of asymmetry as well. Yeah, that's so a different point, and I, th I think yeah. another very important one. So I thank you for it. Well, uh, I think we can uh, thank Jason once again, and um, <laughs> and and I thank all of you for your time and attention. And Jason did mention in his talk uh, that uh, he could be emailed. I have his email address, so those of you who have mine or can find it via our website, which hopefully is is uh, uh, very easy for you to do, uh, please let me know if you'd like to reach him or follow up with him in some way, and we can keep this conversation going. Thank you all.